Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And so he wants me to obey every law because I'm to be the best citizen possible, and you guys too. The best citizens of heaven are good citizens down here on earth. And you know our citizenship is in heaven. Our primary allegiance is to the Lord, but it doesn't let us off the hook down here because we're representing Him. In today's broadcast, we have a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, The Law of Love. We're looking at Romans chapter 13, wherein Paul discusses things like submitting to government, loving our neighbors, and putting on Christ. So let's listen in. There's an old poem that says, do this and live the law demands, but gives us neither strength nor hand. A better word the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. The picture here, the contrast here, is between the old covenant of law and the new covenant that points us to the cross. The, the, the new covenant in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. The law demanded of us, but Jesus did for us. And that's the great difference. The law, no one but Jesus ever kept it, so everyone was condemned by it. But condemned and hopeless and helpless sinners find mercy and grace at the foot of the cross. Now, our standard, therefore, because we're not under the law, not the law of Moses, but under the law of love, the standard is actually higher. The bar is actually raised. We're no longer just trying not to do what's evil and trying to do some things God tells us to do, but we're... We're operating under the highest possible motive. We love him because he first loved us. We demonstrate our love toward him by obeying him. If you love me, keep my commandments. Last thing that I'll say as we get into this chapter is that we need to know when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, it doesn't just mean the stuff he said recorded for us in red. It's all the things the Bible has to say to us as believers. And if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you, today is the day of salvation. Before you leave this room, or before you leave the overflow, if that's where you're at today, you want to make sure, make sure that you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus. Well, he begins with a command. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. He will multiply reasons to obey this command. But let me say, Paul could have simply said, thus says the Lord. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. And that would be sufficient. If you're a parent, you remember when your kids were little, and you'd say, go clean your room, or go make your bed, or go do this. And they'd say, why? And your answer would be, because I... That's right. Even those of you who are younger, remember, because it was said to you not that long ago. But this is the deal. God could just say, because I said so. Or Paul could say, because he says so. But Paul multiplies reasons, and here's why. God is a reasonable God. He says, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll wash them white as snow. Well, it's a straightforward command. It's easy to understand. And then he begins to lay out for us how important it is. There is no authority, we read, except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, no authority except the authority God institutes, that God ordains. We learned this when we went through the book of Daniel, didn't we? We saw that, that well, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And the dream troubles him. He doesn't know the meaning of it, and so he calls in his wise guys he thought they were wise men earlier, and now he realizes, I got a bunch of wise guys on staff. 
Because he says, I want you to tell me the dream and I want, me, want you to tell me the interpretation. And they're like, well, just tell us the dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. Well, he's figured it out. If he says what the dream is, they can say anything they want and how will he know? But if they can tell him what the dream was and the interpretation, he'll know they're really onto something. So he demands what they say was absolutely unreasonable. He says, you tell me the dream, you tell me the interpretation. They said, no one can do that. But Daniel volunteers. And as he does, he says, hey, guys, be praying. This is a tough one. But he goes in and, and he stands before the Pharaoh and, or, or the king and, and, and he says, listen, there is a God in heaven who knows the future and he's revealed to you the things that are and will be. He gave you a kingdom. He made you the ruler over the entire world. Now, remember, Daniel is a slave in Babylon. And he's simply been elevated because he was a faithful steward of God's gifts. He was a faithful man, even as a slave in a very wicked, wicked uh, city. And, and so basically what he does is he says, God's shown you what's going to happen you are that ruler, you are this head of gold. And, and then he goes from, uh, well, you know, after you, the Medo-Persians will rule, then the Grecians, then the Romans. By the way, the Romans are ruling at the time Paul writes these things. So we have the connection between Daniel and this vision of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I mentioned last night and failed to mention first service. If you read Daniel 2, you get this whole thing from man's perspective. If you read Daniel 7, you get the whole thing from God's perspective. And I encourage you to do both. See the way men see the kingdoms of men, this glorious image, and then the way God sees it, these ravenous beasts, which more accurate, I believe. But in any case, we deal with a, a separate issue, but, but that's just making the point there's no authority except from God. Each kingdom, every king, every ruler... And so if it's the, the Babylonians or it's the Medo-Persians or it's the Grecians or it's the Romans or it's the Democrats or the Republicans or it's the Independents, whoever rules, rules by God's authority. Then he says in verse 2, whoever resists the authority or the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So if you resist the authority, you resist God. If you rebel against authority, you're rebelling against God. And that will lead to judgment. Now, Paul chooses his words wisely because he knows human nature. He knows men will always look for loopholes. In fact, I've shared with some of you, W.C. Fields, if you remember him, or even if you don't, some of his friends came in one day and he was reading the Bible. Now, he's not the kind of guy you expect to see reading the Bible, at least, you know, his background and his activities. So they're like, W.C., what are you doing? And he's like, looking for loopholes. Well, I think a lot of people are looking for loopholes, and I would like to suggest there are none. But there is one exception to obeying the laws of men. And the men that make those laws. And that would be when man's law contradicts God's law. When man's command contradicts man, God's command. We saw this with Daniel's three friends. They were commanded with everyone else. When the worship starts, the music's going, you bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And they're like, well, that's not going to happen. And he gives them another chance and they said, that's still not going to happen. And then it, I, I love their response to him. They're like, listen... Our God's able to save us. We don't know if he will or not. But either way, we'll be done with you and we will not bow down to this image. What was the result? They were cast in a fiery furnace. I bring this to your attention because it says, if you resist the authority, you resist the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Even if you do the right thing, which is doing what God tells you, not man, you could still suffer at the hand of man, you see. So it's not a like get out of uh, jail free or get out of the fire free card. No, they went into the fire, but then they saw one like unto the Son of Man walking with them in the midst of that literal fiery trial. They not only survived it, they thrived in the midst of it. They were elevated in the eyes of the people and of the king. Well, 
He goes on then to say, rulers, verse 3, are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Drive 65. No, I know it doesn't say that here, but, but uh, it's what God showed me. And if you've had this experience, you're driving along and you see the black and white and you see a guy out there with a big old smile and a radar gun and you're like, oh my gosh, and you look down and you're going 65 and you're like, oh. Oh, and then you just got a big smile and you're like waving at the highway patrol and he's giving you the thumbs up. At least this is how I picture it all happening. <laughs> now, here's the deal. I have actually learned it's possible to drive the speed limit even on a long trip and even on the freeways. You know how you do it? Two words, cruise control. That's the only way that works for me. Lead foot, smooth car. I have everything working against me. Long trip, you know. Short attention span. So, so all of that to say, we can bring this down to the most basic level, and we need to. We don't want to just think, well, philosophically about the commands of God. They're practical. And so he wants me to obey every law because I'm to be the best citizen possible, and you guys too. The best citizens of heaven are good citizens down here on earth. And you know our citizenship is in heaven. Our primary allegiance is to the Lord, but it doesn't let us off the hook down here because we're representing him. So if it's a tyrant, if it's a ruler, if it's someone we disagree with, we're still to be submissive. And when you're dealing with law enforcement, let me share just a couple things. I think that the cars used to say, and they probably do in some cities, Serve and protect. I like that because that's exactly what the pastors are called to do. And you see, that law enforcement is to the society outwardly what pastors are to the church here inside. And, and, and it's like we're to serve. We serve by ministering the word, by being an example, by praying, by all trying to meet every need that God enables us to meet. And then we try to protect in the same way. We're like, hey, this is what the word says. Don't go there. Don't engage. Don't do it. And in fact, we'll talk about conscience in a minute and see that God has made it possible to keep us from all those things that devastate us and, and defile us. So he's saying, if you want to be unafraid, just do what's right. Do what is good. That's his very word. And then he says, and you will have praise from the same. Now, he goes on to say he is God's minister to you for good. That's how I came up with the idea that the, the, the police, the, the law enforcement, they really are working for us. And their ministry really is twofold. They're to protect the innocent and punish the guilty. Now, we live in trying times and in a very difficult state. And this isn't a political statement, it is just a, a statement of truth. Our law enforcement does their best to protect the innocent by arresting the criminal, arresting the guilty. But then in our system, lots of times, even if you got the guy red-handed and you got the video and you have a confession, you can still get off on some weird technicality. If you have enough money and you get a good enough lawyer, yeah, there are loopholes in our law just not in God's. So what happens is, is people can think this whole thing just isn't working. It's not working the way it's supposed to. How am I supposed to deal then? The same way. I'm supposed to be submitted. I should pray for those over me, and I do. Pray for our government. Oh, my gosh, for the state of California. We are so mixed up. We are at the place where we are actually punishing the innocent by freeing the guilty. Well, in any case, he says, here's how we're to see those who are over us in the Lord. They are ministers to us for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now, our Law enforcement officers don't carry swords anymore. They did at one point, but I would, that's before me. That's like Civil War, right? And so now what do we have? You see somebody, they got a club, they got a taser, and they got a gun. You don't want them to pull any of those out. 
because you don't want an encounter with any of them. And so he's saying he's carrying those things for this very reason, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, verse 5, not only because of wrath. He's dealing now with motivation, not just because we're afraid of consequence, but also for conscience sake. Now, I like that. Think about it for a moment. God has given every single person, if you're a believer, if you're an unbeliever, he's given you a conscience. Now, I remember when my conscience used to bug me. And that's because I didn't understand why I felt guilty even before I did that thing. And then felt worse after I did it. God gave me a conscience. So he'd be saying, hey, don't go that way. And this is before I was even walking with him. Don't do it. You know this isn't right. And that little inner voice, I was like, I don't know. It's like, it messed with me. And, it, and now I know that was God's gift to me. But as a Christian, my conscience is super activated by the Holy Spirit. So it's not impossible for me to fall or trip or stumble. But it's much more difficult because it's like there are stop signs and flashing lights and do not enter and turn away and get out quick and all of these things. That's what comes to mind, you see. So it isn't like, well, I ought to try that. Or maybe that wouldn't be so bad. Or I'm not sure that, you know, all the crazy things we Christians say, well, did God really mean I'm not supposed to? Hey, if you're asking that question, the answer is yes. He meant it. And even if he didn't, well, just the fact that you're asking, you probably should stay away from it. So here's the deal. Subject not only because of what might go wrong if I disobey, but because I don't want to violate my own conscience. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. And I have both working on my behalf internally. So it isn't just what's happening externally. That's what happens if you fail internally. You get to the external. And that just gets worse and worse, by the way. If you're young and in school, you know, if you don't, Obey the teacher, you talk to the, the principal. If you don't obey the principal, well, then it's, you know, I don't know where you go from there. You go home. And that, in my day, was no good. And so, uh, anyway, not just because of wrath, but because of conscience. For this, for because of this, he says, you also pay taxes. So if you wondered, why do we pay so many taxes? He's saying we're paying them to support those who are ministering to us, taking care of us, watching over us. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Now, I actually learned something I didn't know this time around. My entire Christian experience, as I've read and understood or thought I did this passage, I thought the attending continually to this very thing referred back to the collecting taxes, because that was my experience. Seems like they're just always busy doing that. But it actually is a reference not to the collecting of taxes, but to the ministry that the taxes make possible. By the way, that word subject, be subject, it's hupotasso. In the Greek, it means to rank yourself under another. At home, this is simple. Dad, mom, and then the kids. Everybody's over you. Everyone you look up to, they're over you. But... When you get to the age where you're out on your own and that's where the line is drawn, that's when dad and mom can share their opinion. You still need to honor, you should respect, you should ask. But you can actually make your own decision. So if you're home and you're struggling with your parents and you're like, well, I want to do what I want to do. Don't worry, that day's coming. But here's the bad news. You really don't get to anyway. It's like, you know, they're the boss and you're like, I want to be the boss. So finally you get out on your own and you're there and you're alone and you're the boss. The boss over who? The boss over what? No one, nothing. There's no one to boss around. And, and, and so the, the point is we are to rank ourselves under those who are in authority over us. Whether they're in the government or rather they're in the, the um, you know, home. So... Um, Again, not fear of consequence, though that does restrain some, but this higher motivation, doing the right thing 
for the right reason or the best thing for the best reason. Render therefore to all their due, verse 7, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Throughout the rest of this chapter, Paul is going to, to give us pairs of things to consider together. Taxes and customs go together. The first has to do with our daily taxes. The second has to do with our yearly taxes. The daily taxes, well, we pay those every time we buy something or every time we sell something. I'm not complaining about it. It's just the reality. The yearly taxes, if you own a house, you pay your uh, property taxes. Most of us pay them twice a year, but some people pay them once a year. And in any case, you got to have those in. If you drive a car, you have to register it every year. That's a form of a tax. And, and so what he's saying is as citizens first of the kingdom of God, then citizens of the country in which we're living, we need to pay our debts. In a minute, it'll say, oh, no one, anything except the debt of love. We'll, we'll talk about how important that particular debt is. But here he says, rendering fear and honor to whom fear and honor are due. The first has to do with respect and dread. So it's like, you know, okay, I realize that, that I could get in real trouble here. The second is reverence for the one, again, who outranks you. Now, Paul goes to the core issue, the issue of the heart. And, and he does it before returning to the law and contrasting again. And what he says is, let no debt go unpaid. In other words, whoever you owe, pay them. Whatever you owe, pay them. Owe no one anything has been misunderstood it's not saying we shouldn't own a home and have a mortgage or shouldn't own a car or, and have a payment. Although if you can, you know, buy a car and not have a payment, it's much better because you have that money every month to do something else. But that's a personal preference, at least my personal preference. That's why we have old cars, nice cars, but they're old. And so they're older than some of the people that come into the services. But in any case, owe no one anything except to love one another. Now, the reason he says we need to owe that debt is it's a debt we pay every day. How often does God forgive me? Well, I'd like to say daily, but that would suggest I only need forgiveness daily. No, I need forgiveness every time I do or think anything that's out of the will of God for my life. And you need the same. So God is constantly forgiving me, constantly showing mercy to me, in every situation, showering his grace on me. And he's saying, I need to be that way with other people. We talked about it last time. He's not talking here about the love that's physical attraction or the love that's friendship or the love that's family affection. The word's agape. We're to love one another the way God loves us. And he who loves another has fulfilled the law. That's why it has to be God's kind of love. It's not like, well, I love people. You know, no, it's, it's do you love them the way Jesus loves them? And we saw last time, a, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Growing up, my grandfather used to say, along with many others, there are two things we will never discuss in this house, and those are religion and politics. So why do those two things seem to get lumped together? Well, because they strike a nerve with many people. People have strong opinions about both and will defend their position viciously if they feel attacked. In today's message, Pastor Sam looked at what Paul said about obeying the laws of the land and of our government. And this alone can strike that same nerve with people who don't agree with the current administration or feel at odds with the laws of the land. Learning to set aside our political preferences can be a difficult thing, but if we just think about how Jesus handled it, it can give us a great guide. In Matthew 22, 21, Jesus clarified how he felt about it when he said that Caesar's image is on this coin, so give the coin to Caesar, yet give to God what belongs to God. You and I belong to God, and he's telling us to submit to the government's authority. This does not mean that you have to vote for them. Just obey. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. 
You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.